What do these three things mean to you? I'm going to give you a few seconds to answer. Okay, so that was a few seconds. Hi everyone, my name is Kim. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist, a certified diabetes care and education specialist, a certified nutrition support clinician, and owner of KimRoseDietitian.com. Welcome back to my channel. So I think it was about a month or two ago, I promised you guys that I would do a case study on a critically ill COVID-19 patient. And today, that's exactly what we're going to do. So before we begin, before we commence and jump into the case study, I just simply wanted to let you know that this particular scenario is not based off of any type of patient that I've seen in my hospital, but this is just frequently asked questions that I do get from other dietitians and also students. So I wanted to address these questions for you guys and also to let you guys be aware that I'm just laying the foundation here. To get into the nitty gritty things related to ECMO and all those things, you're not going to find this in this particular video, but that does give me an idea to make a video about that. But let's jump into this case study and see what I have for you guys today. So today we have a 74 year old male with a history of type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, COPD, and stage 4 chronic kidney disease that presented to the emergency room with a fever, dehydration, and shortness of breath. Upon admission, he was diagnosed with COVID-19 and pneumonia, and he also had an elevated temperature of 102 degrees. Due to his declining respiratory function and a desire to protect his airway, he was intubated in the emergency room and then transferred to the critical care unit or the ICU. Within 24 hours of intubation, he was properly rehydrated and he is hemodynamically stable. He was placed in the prone position and within 48 hours of admission, you receive a consult to start the patient on enteral nutrition and the doctor, specifically the nephrologist, made a decision to start him on continual renal replacement therapy because of his trending creatinine levels. So the questions that I have been getting asked a lot are these questions. Question number one, how do you calculate his macronutrient needs, specifically his calories and protein? Question number two, is it okay to feed the patient in the prone position? Question number three, what type of feeding should be initiated. And question number four, what type of formula should be used? And question number five, when we get into the nitty gritty, how are we going to calculate that tube feeding for this particular patient? So let's get into it. So with the macronutrient needs, we're looking at two things for this particular scenario. We are looking at calories and we're also looking at protein, but we're going to begin with calories first. So I know in this particular situation, I did not give you a height, I did not give you a weight, and that was intentional, which you're going to see on question number five. But there's a few things that I wanna point out to you, the dietitian or the um, dietetic intern or the aspiring dietitian that's still doing their undergrad. These are things that you need to be aware of. So for the calorie needs, you know you have been told that this patient is mechanically intubated, you have been told that they do have a hypercatabolic illness, which is the COPD, and you're also told that they do have a temperature. You're told these three things. What do these three things mean to you? I'm going to give you a few seconds to answer. Okay, so that was a few seconds. So basically what it means to you is that their calorie needs are going to be very high. So when someone has a catabolic illness, when they have a temperature, when they're intubated, their calorie needs sometimes can be a, a little high. So the gold standard for calculating calorie needs at this time is indirect calorimetry. But because this, COVID, this patient has COVID-19, you do not want to use indirect calorimetry. And plus, depending on the facility where you work, it may be expensive to use it. So something that you do want to use instead, and the reason why you don't want to use indirect calorimetry is because you can um, easily expose yourself to the COVID-19. So something else that you want to use instead is 25 to 30 kcal per kilogram body weight to estimate the calorie needs. 
The second thing that we're going to look at is protein. So I want to ask you a question. Do you think that this particular patient, their protein needs are going to be high or low? Go ahead and comment in the comment section below. Or if you're uncomfortable commenting in the comment section, just comment in your head. So if you said that their needs are going to be high, you are absolutely correct. And the reason why they're going to be high is because number one, they have COVID-19 and for some reason, um, different papers, journal articles that I've been reading and things that I have been witnessing firsthand, calorie uh, protein needs, excuse me, are just really high for this particular population. Additionally, on top of that, you were told that they are on CRRT, Continual Renal Replacement Therapy. And Continual Renal Replacement Therapy does boost the protein needs. So the protein needs can range anywhere between 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram body weight. And then something that I feel like, you know, just throwing out in there in the air is enteral nutrition is the way to go. You are told that this patient is hemodynamically stable, which is perfect. So you know that there's not going to be any concerns with intestinal ischemia. So if the gut works, definitely use it. And the reason why you want to use the gut is because you want to maintain that intestinal mucosa, um, not only for GI function, but for overall health and immunity as well. The second question is proning. Is it okay to feed a patient that is in the prone position? And the short answer to that is yes, but you have to know what you're doing. So there are some type of sedatives and we weren't told specifically in this scenario what sedative this particular patient is on, but there are some sedatives that impact the skeletal muscles and there are sedatives that impact the smooth muscles. So the sedative that is used in my particular hospital only impacts the skeletal muscles and it has no impact whatsoever on the smooth muscles. So I do feed. Um, there are some practitioners who may be afraid to feed enterally simply because the patient is in the prone position, but you just want to make sure that the patient is in the reverse Trendlin Trendlinburg. I always have a hard time saying that and that they are elevated uh, 15 to 35 degrees for tolerance as well. And on top of that, we also have to be aware of certain type of um, sedatives that do impact the smooth muscles which is your entire GI tract so if you have sedatives that impact the smooth muscles you may have tolerance issues in that patient but that's not to say that sedatives that are considered a neuromuscular um, block blockers can't impact these smooth muscles as well so you do want to monitor for GI tolerance so this brings us to the next question and as you can see these questions all build on one another so the next question is about feeding. Um, how should feeding be initiated? So feeding should definitely be initiated slow. Feeding should be between 15 to 25 kcal per kilogram per day. And feeding may even be post pyloric feeding if you have a patient that may be high for aspiration risk or may have tolerance issues. So what I mean by post pyloric is you're feeding directly into that small intestine. And this is important as well because according to Aspen, anyone that is over the age of 70 automatically because of their age has a high risk of aspiration. So post pyloric tube feeds may be the way to go. The next question is what type of formula should be initiated and I don't know about you but when I was a dietetic intern, when I was a new dietitian, this question always stumped me. What formula do I use? And of course this depends on your hospital, it depends what you have on your formulary, it depends on what the med exec committee uh, approved. So I'm not going to be throwing out any type of brand names here. Um, but whatever company that you use for your tube feeds make sure that your tube feeding formula meets these criteria so you definitely want to make sure that um, you have a high protein polymeric isosomotic enteral formula and i know that was a mouthful to say but specifically what this means is that it's a standard formula that is designed for adults and children who have normal digestion standard formulas include all the nutrients required to maintain health 
and the term high protein is pretty much uh, self-explanatory and also polymeric which means that it contains whole proteins complex carbs and also long chain triglycerides and then the last term isosomatic means that it basically has a similar osmolality to your body fluids which minimize tolerance issues so basically guys these are just standard high protein formulas you don't have to find any that already has um you know the breakdown of certain proteins or certain triglycerides in them you don't have to have any of those type of elemental formulas it's just a standard formula and then the last question how do you calculate how do you calculate uh tube feedings for this population so calculating tube feedings for this population is not any different from calculating tube feedings for populations that do not have COVID-19. If you want to figure out how to calculate a tube feed, if this is not something that is comfortable for you, if you need more practice on it, then did you check out my RDE blueprint? My RDE blueprint takes you step by step by step, breaking everything down, showing you where the numbers come from and why you need to do things in that particular manner. Well, that is it for today. If you have any questions related to anything that I reviewed in today's video or my RDE blueprint, please do not hesitate to leave it in my comment section below. As usual, remember to comment, like, subscribe, and share this video. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Oh, and also guys, if you have any particular case studies that you would like me to do, please go ahead and put that in the comment section as well. I already know someone asked me about bari a bariatric case study, which is not my specialty. So I'm trying to find a dietitian to do that. And I have a video coming up soon on motivational interviewing. So that was a mouthful. Until next time. Bye guys.